Welcome to worship on this 20th Sunday after Pentecost. Um, at the risk of embarrassing one of our council members, do you know where the best seat in the house is to sit when you have children? The front. Because they can see, and then they're not going to be uh, bored to death sitting in the back pew. So I'm really thankful that you're right up here in front of me, and I can embarrass all of you, right? All four of you. <laughs> no. So I just, as I was helping Lowell this morning, I remembered that I did not even refer to the title this morning in my sermon. Well, not necessarily, not directly. But you know the phrase, there's no I in team, right? There's also really no I in faith. It's all about God. And that's part of what I'm, where I'm going. I, mean, I have faith in God, but God, I have faith because of God. Um, and so navigating the I is kind of a two-way uh, wording this morning that I forgot all about when I was writing my sermon. <laughs> there you go. All right. This is also the eve of Native American uh, Sunday, as we call in this, um, in this state. Other states call indigenous, indigenous Peoples Day. And so there's a statement that our South Dakota Synod put together that I've adapted for this day. It's called the Land Acknowledgement. Tomorrow, October 11th, is Native American Day in South Dakota, elsewhere known as Indigenous Peoples Day. Recognizing that, we acknowledge that we worship today on land originally held by members of the Oseti Sokoan, the Seven Council Fires of the Lakota, Dakota, Nakota, the Arakara, and the Cheyenne. Our state of South Dakota is the current home of the Cheyenne River Sioux Tribe, Crow Creek Sioux Tribe, Flandreau Santee Sioux Tribe, Lower Brule Sioux Tribe, Oglala Sioux Tribe, Rosebud Sioux Tribe, Sistan Wapaton Oyate, and the Standing Rock Sioux Tribe. South Dakota Synod of the Evangelical Lutheran Church recognizes that, and we recognize that we are called to be in good relationship with our neighbors that the tribes are sovereign nations, that there's a history of broken treaties and broken trust, and that there's lots of work to be done. We also recognize that as Christians, we have faith in new life, in hope of mending what is broken, and in our calling through the Holy Spirit to do this work. We ask God then to guide and protect our relationships with all indigenous peoples and the lives of indigenous peoples themselves. There we go. This morning, then, our opening worship hymn is... Praise and thanksgiving. Please rise as you are able.
The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And also you. you are a treasured people of the Lord. Keep the words of the Lord in your heart. Teach them to your children. One does not live by bread alone. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Almighty and ever-living God, increase in us your gift of faith that forsaking what lies behind and reaching out to lies ahead, we may follow the way of your commandments and receive the crown of everlasting joy through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. You may be seated as our choir sings for us this morning for the first time this season. first reading is from Amos chapter 5 verses 6 through 7 and verses 10 through 15. Seek the Lord and live or he will break out against the house of Joseph like fire and it will devour Bethel with no one to quench it. Ah you that turn justice to wormwood and bring righteousness to the ground. They hate the one who reproves in the gate and they adhor the one who speaks the truth. Therefore, because you trample on the poor and take from them le levies of grain, you have built houses of hewn stone, and you shall not live in them. You have planted pleasant vineyards, but you shall not drink their wine. For I know how many are your transgressions and how great are your sins. You who afflict the righteous, who take a bribe and push aside the needy in the gate. Therefore, the prudent will keep silent in such a time, for it is an evil time. Seek good and not evil, that you may live. And so the Lord, the God of hosts, will be with you, just as you have said. Hate evil and love good, and establish justice in the gate. It may be that the Lord and the God of hosts will be, right, will be gracious to the remnant of Joseph. 
Please read responsively the psalm. So teach us to number our days that we may apply our hearts to wisdom. Satisfy us with your steadfast love in the morning. So shall we rejoice and be glad all of our days. Show your servants your works and your splendor to their children. The second reading comes from Hebrews chapter 4, verses 12 through 16. Indeed, the word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing until it divides soul from spirit, joints from marrow. It is able to judge the thoughts and intentions of the heart, and before him no creature is hidden, but all are naked and laid bare, to the eyes of the one to whom we must render an account. Since then, we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God. Let us hold fast to our confession. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who in every respect has been tested as we are, yet without sin. Let us therefore approach the throne of grace with boldness, so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Here ends the reading. The Holy Gospel according to Mark, the 10th chapter. As Jesus was setting out on a journey, a man ran up and knelt before him and asked him, Good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus said to him, Why do you call me good? No one is good but God alone. You know the commandments. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery, you shall not steal, you shall not bear false witness, you shall not defraud, honor your father and mother. He said to him, Teacher, I have kept all these since my youth. Jesus, looking at him, loved him and said, You lack one thing. Go sell what you own and give the money to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come, follow me. When he heard this, he was shocked and went away grieving, for he had many possessions. Then Jesus looked around and said to his disciples, How hard it will be for those who have wealth to enter the kingdom of God. And the disciples were perplexed at these words. But Jesus said to them again, Children, how hard it is to enter the kingdom of God. It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of God. They were greatly astounded and said to one another, Then who can be saved? Jesus looked at them and said, For mortals... It is impossible, but not for God. For God, all things are possible. Peter began to say to him then, Look, we have left everything and followed you. Jesus said, Truly I tell you, there is no one who has left house, or brothers, or sisters, or mother, or father, or children, or fields, for my sake and for the sake of the good news, who will not receive a hundredfold now in this age, houses, brothers and sisters, mothers and children and fields, with persecutions, and in the age to come, eternal life. But many who are first will be last, and the last will be first. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise you may be seated.
Sisters and brothers, grace be to you and peace from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus the Christ. Amen. I asked a group of men recently, what did you give up when you got married? It took them a while to answer, but what it boiled down to, it seemed, was that most believed they had gained as much or more than they had given up, which I guess is a good thing. Usually when I preach on this text, the theme has been strictly about money or wealth. You know, Jesus saying that it's harder for a camel to get through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. Now, some have debated whether Jesus meant an actual needle or the gate leading into Jerusalem that was called the needle gate. Or maybe there was a geographic formation that was very narrow and was called the eye of the needle. It doesn't matter because what Jesus is saying is that too much wealth makes it hard to pursue God's way of life, which is eternal life. I'm reminded of pictures like this that I've seen where trucks were too big to fit under an overpass or, more recently, a plane on a truck that was too big to fit under a bridge. Same is true, I think, when a person has too much money. It's hard to squeeze it into a Jesus kind of life. Too much money can wind up making people focus on the wrong things, even neglecting Jesus entirely. And that focus is, I believe, more the focus of Jesus' comments this morning. For example, what's the first thing that the man asked Jesus? What must I do to inherit the kingdom of God? Okay. Think about it. What can I do or anybody do to inherit anything? Whose job is it to leave that inheritance? It's all up to the person who's giving, not receiving, to determine whether I'm going to inherit anything or not. It's not up to me. I know there, there are people who will try to, to cozy up to rich people in, in hopes of inheriting something. You may have seen it in families, maybe even in your own family. But ultimately, those people have no control over that inheritance. In fact, you may know people who worked hard to try to, to, to butter up their, their loved one, their grandfather, their, a rich person that maybe they don't even know. And hope, uh, in hopes of inheriting something and been disappointed because of all the work they'd done to try to get on that person's good side. It's an irony, but it can be true. Our eternal inheritance is not up to us. It's all up to God. We can't buy it. We can't earn it. We can't coerce God into giving it to us. It is a free gift, just as is true of any inheritance. However, what wealth, especially extreme wealth, can do is to make people believe that they have influence. Dale Carnegie, some of you may have taken his course, How to Win Friends and Influence People. If you read much about politics these days, you know one common way that it's done on either side of the aisle is through money. But it doesn't work with God. He doesn't work that way. Now, there are ministers who have preached and still do a false gospel that claims that, that if you give enough money to their ministries, God will reward you. If you went through the 80s as I did, you may recognize these two ministers, the bakers, who tried that approach. God, might, God does reward faithful people in the Bible with earthly rewards. On the other hand, the Bible is also clear that earthly rewards have no heavenly impact. In fact, they may have the opposite effect. As Jesus has said, and I paraphrase, those people have the reward. They don't need mine. I'm told that there was a man, I hope I'm getting this right, who did give up everything to engage in some missionary endeavor. In fact, he said, I gave it up once, I can do it again. But you know what? Once he earned his money back again, and he did, he could not give it away. It was just too painful to do it all over again. 
I hate to break it to you, but the American dream of the self-made man or woman is false. We don't earn anything by ourselves. We don't own anything by ourselves. We have nothing by ourselves. As we sing in the hymn, all that we have is thine alone, a trust, O Lord, from thee. Recognizing that is the first step toward entering the kingdom of God, a kingdom where those who gain the most are often those who have the least to lose. Consider the man called the Good Samaritan. This is not about money. Well, except at the very end. He saw, this was a man who was despised by all of Jewish society. Okay? But he saw a man lying by the side of the road who had been beat up and robbed. And he went to his aid. Now, just before he got there, there were two very religious people, one priest, one leader in the Jewish synagogue, who went by on the other side, wouldn't touch him because to do so would violate purity laws that would prevent them from being a part of worship until they could get all ritually cleaned up again. The Samaritan, on the other hand, could not get into worship anyway because he was considered unclean to begin with because of who he was, and so he had nothing to lose. And so he took the man, bound up his wounds, took him to a place where he could stay the night, told the, the, the man in charge there, here, take some money for, your, for his care. If you need anything, I'll be back and pay you what you need. Now, evidently, the Samaritan had some money. I mean, money can do good things. Huh? You know that. I know that. But what he didn't have was social or religious status, which is exactly what the two religious men did not want to give up. And so they left the man lying there to die. Because the otherwise rejected Samaritan was willing to give up his time, and had nothing else to lose, he gained a place in the gospel story. Time and again, Jesus observes that those who have little, whether it's money or food or prestige, are more willing to give than those who have much. Research has shown that people gave a larger percentage of their income during the Great Depression than they did when things were going well. Stories abound from time to time of people who would feed anyone who happened to drop in during that time. You may, if you grew up during that time or have heard stories of that time, you may recognize that as being true. Some of you may have experienced that yourselves. I'm sure Dennis Shield could tell you stories of, of that happening in Haiti, where people who have nothing are still willing to give to those who have less. Same can be true found in our reservations. The story of the rich man, as it is often called, is not a story about wealth alone, but about priorities. Jesus said anything is possible with God. Indeed, wealthy people can enter the kingdom of God. They just can't buy it. If they divest themselves of their control over what they have and give it over to God, God can and will use it to bless them and others alike now and in the future, in spiritual as well as in material ways, all in the service of eternal and abundant life. It's not all, just also, it's also not what, about what gets us into heaven. Eternal life begins in this life, with a life given fully to God's rule, to God's kingdom. The kingdom of God is a way of life in this world and the next. Obviously, the next life, heaven, is totally beyond our control. As is the kingdom of God in this life. God's kingdom just is, and we enter into it when we give up all control over our lives and our possessions and give them all to God. The more one has, the more one values one's life and property in this world, the harder that is to do, however. Most of us are wealthy by the world's standards, believe it or not. We talk about the 1% and how rich they are, but I went online this week to a, to a global wealth 
calculator. It's called the Global Rich List. And I discovered that I am among the richest 7% of people in this world. Now, I don't consider myself wealthy by any means. 7%. I'm in the top 7% of the richest people in this world. If you live alone and, and, and earn $10,000 a year, you're still in the top 20%. So yes, we here today are indeed rich by the world's standards. What we do with that wealth is important both to God and to the rest of the world's population. But it still would allow us to buy our way into heaven. Eternal life, which the rich man sought, is a free gift that God offers to the world to the life and death and resurrection of Jesus. It's more than the next world thing. In this world, eternal life is the way of life that involves, in part, acknowledging that we have nothing and are nothing without God. And that God has everything in abundance. Allowing God's people to share abundantly from God's own resources. It's an acknowledgement that God holds our lives forever in his hands. Allowing you and me to risk. To risk everything we have and everything we are. Our lives, our possessions, our, our, our reputations, everything for him and for our neighbor. Now, Jesus' disciples complained that they'd left everything behind to follow him. They were just as proud and possessive of what they'd given up as the rich man was of what he had gained. To, G- to that, Jesus responded, they'd, they'd get it all back in spades because they had chosen to follow him. Again, this is just not about money, but about time and jobs and family members, whatever whatever it is that gives you value in this world. We have value because God made us, and God loves us, and God calls us his own. That's it. We can be useful to God when we follow his commands, care for our neighbors in need, claim that value that God has given us, but know that nothing we do makes us any more valuable than God has already made us. We can fail to do everything we try, but that doesn't make us any less valuable. And believing somehow that it does can actually keep us from following him. What if I make a mistake? I read, I was watching a, or listening to a podcast this morning about embarrassing moments. We've all had them, right? Tripping on the sidewalk or doing something even more embarrassing. And we look around, has anybody seen us? doesn't make us any less valuable in God's eyes when we make those mistakes. That's why we come here to confess, right? To say, God, we've messed up. Please forgive us and renew us in your uh, kingdom. There's a saying that the person who dies with the most toys wins. It's not true. (laughs) They only die with their toys. It's those who live and die trusting in God's abundant grace who are the real winners. Like the Samaritan or the thief on the cross, the one who believed in Jesus, he too had nothing to lose, leaning on God's grace, leaning on Jesus for his salvation. He was already literally bound to die. The other thief clung to his life, asking Jesus to save his life, his own life, Jesus' life, and the thieves. The believing one gave his life over to Jesus, and as a result, Gain Jesus' promise of life in paradise with him. Talk about a return on investment. Giving our lives to Jesus and receiving them back into eternity. Amen. Please rise and sing.
In Christ you have heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation. Living together in trust and hope, we confess our faith. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Build yourselves up on your most holy faith. Keep yourselves in the love of God. If anyone is in Christ, there is a new creation. God has given us the ministry of reconciliation. Therefore, let us be reconciled to God and to one another. Gracious God, have mercy on us. In your compassion, forgive us our sins, known and unknown, things left and left undone. Uphold us by your Spirit so that we may live and serve you in newness of life to the honor and glory of your holy name, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Almighty God, have mercy on you, forgive you all your sins through our Lord Jesus Christ, strengthen you in all goodness, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep you in eternal life. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you always. Please turn and greet one another with that peace. God's peace. I want to highlight some announcements this week uh, following worship today. Um, the uh, ninth grade uh, conference will uh, ask to, our mass to meet up in the uh, sun, upstairs off the balcony in the farthest Sunday school room, and we'll do some work preparing for affirmation or baptism. Um, also, are the women meeting this morning? Yes, okay, so the, the uh, Naomi Rebecca Circle is also meeting this morning um, following worship. Let's see. Ele from 11 to 12.30 tomorrow at Sweetgrass, there will be a, uh, an experiential uh, program uh, in, in recognition of Domestic Abuse Awareness Month. Uh, there are it's more information um, in the back of your bulletin and on the, uh, the flyer that's on the fellowship uh, room door. Um, so this is from 11 to 12.30 tomorrow at Sweetgrass. T Tuesday, Tuesday the 12th. I keep getting it mixed up in my head, and so thank you. Um, take note of the Women's Annual Bazaar and the fact that they are looking for Thrivent cards that they can use toward the cost of that so that they can reap the most benefit from that. We have a bunch of birthdays this week, and including Ole Tividal, who will be 99 years old on the 16th. 99 years old. So if you think of it, send him a card, uh, send him a greeting, along with the rest on our list. Riker and Jared and Jean and Lori and Jordan. In our prayers this morning, um, we include Mark, the family and friends of Mark Major, uh, who died this past week, his funeral will be next Sunday in Montana. Please look for a, uh, 
uh, uh, obituary will be in the paper this week. Also, your prayers for my sister Anne, who will be starting chemotherapy uh, this Friday. I will be going to be with her for a couple of days. Um, so, some of you know that process well. Um, I'm about to learn. And then there are announcements that I'm missing this morning. God has been faithful to us and gracious to us. We return thanks with our tithes and our offerings. Let us pray, God, our Creator, you open wide your hand and satisfy the desires of every living creature. With these gifts, we bless you for your tender nurture and care. Help us to delight in your will and walk in your ways through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Just a note before our prayers, if you're wondering who Mark Major was, uh, he was an extension agent here uh, for, for a few years and a friend of some of our uh, members. Made children and heirs by God's promise, we pray for the church, the world, and all in need.
uniting God, you call forth different gifts in those who follow you. Encourage us to welcome the diverse benefits and blessings of the whole church in teaching, prophecy, diverse, uh, healing, and more. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. Nurturing God, you bring forth crops from the soil and bounty from the trees. Increase the produce of the land and bless all, those, all who toil in fields and orchards and pastures. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. Empowering God, you offer compassion to those who are overlooked, persecuted, or forgotten. Open the hearts of local, national, and world leaders to show such compassion and love for their neighbors. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. Merciful God, on the eve of Indigenous Peoples Day, protect those women and children who are missing, perhaps due to human trafficking. Heal the hearts of those who still suffer from abuse received in boarding schools, and comfort all who grieve those who have died in either circumstance. Help us, your people, to guard the lives of our indigenous relatives. Lord, in your mercy. Sheltering God in Jesus, you traveled among us without a place to lay your head. Provide safe places to sleep and rest for those who have no place to live. Sustain ministries that offer food, clothing, and peace of mind. Lord, in your mercy. Healing God, watch over those who are ill, in pain, or grieving, especially Anne and Jacob, Kathy and Patty, Adeline and Pauline, Vern and Danny, Viola and Darcy, Sue and Iona, Betty and Lynn, Russell and Shirley, Jason and Erica, Conrad and Stephen, Jake, and the families of, of Mark Major. Lord, in your mercy. Renewing God, you bring life out of death. Help us part with those things that are no longer beneficial to us and open our hearts to see where new life is building in this congregation. Lord, in your mercy. Eternal God, we thank you for the lives of those who have died. Make us confident in your promise of salvation and support us in our own journey of faith. Lord, in your mercy. Receive these prayers, O God, and those in our hearts known only to you through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Almighty God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, bless you now and forever. Amen. We sing together God of grace and God of glory.